that good? Y'all ready to worship this morning? Come on, make your way to the front. We're gonna lift up worship to the name above every other name. Come on.
above you. There is You know, that's a really fun song that we get to sing together. But if you really think about what you were just singing, you were just declaring that I will have no other God before you. That means I will put nothing above you, Jesus. Not my worries, not even my school, not my relationships, not my future career, not whatever's going on. There's no other God that I'm going to put before you, Jesus. You are the only one. And you know, as we're standing here in this room and we're singing these words, there's something else that's happening in heaven. There are angels and there are elders that are around the throne right now, and they're saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and who is and who is to come. And we get to be a part of that today. So I want to invite you, can we all just lift our hands? And before we even go any further this morning, I know it's early. I know you guys have been in so many services, but we serve a God that is worthy of our praise. So I want to invite you, can you just lift your voice all over this room? And in your own words, can you just say, holy, holy, holy are you, Lord. Come on, Sagu, lift your voice. Lift your voice this morning. You don't need us to lead you. You are holy, Lord. You are holy. You are Adonai. Elohim. The great I am. He lives.
this moment isn't about it's about you that one more time worthy worthy Thank you. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. Because you were there. Because you were Wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up. All the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones.
Come on, students, let's keep pressing in for just a few more minutes. Jesus, we love you. Jesus, we need you today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It was November about 2003, and I was at a Chi Alpha service at the University of Oklahoma. And I remember being in a service, a chapel, a little bit like this, worshiping on my knees. I'd only been saved for maybe about a year and a half. But I remember in that moment, the Holy Spirit was moving in my life in such a strong way that I prayed a prayer to God that night, Lord, please don't ever let me lose this hunger that I have for you right now. Please don't ever let me forget what you have done in my life. And Lord, I just want to know you more every single day of my life. I know being in a setting like this, this environment, this type of service can become routine. It could be a rut that we get stuck in. But students, I'm here to tell you today, don't ever lose this hunger that you have for Jesus right now. Because it's accessible whenever you need it. And we have to learn, the closer we get to God, we have to start asking the right questions. And the right question is this. It's not, will God show up? It's, will I respond when he does? Because he always will show up. So this morning, it's simple. We're going to pray that God would never let us lose this hunger that we're feeling right now. And we're also going to take the time to once again pray for the nation of Mexico. Yesterday, Pastor Nick said it's so great. You know, the great thing about Sagu is you get to grow in your relationship with God every single day. And they do a great job of teaching you that, helping you walk through that to develop that person you are, that you're becoming. But they also teach you a very important element of the Christian faith, and that is to pray for our world. And so today we're going to pray for the nation of Mexico. You know, it's, it's an interesting stat that we've learned. Back in the 1960s, there were only about 800,000 evangelicals in the nation of Mexico. Today, there were over 9 million. And so we see that God is moving in this nation. And our prayer is this. Just like today, here in America, and just like we wanted to see it in the nation of Mexico, Holy Spirit move. So would you raise your hands right now so we can pray? Father, we say thank you for making yourself so accessible to us, for showing us that you see us every single day, for showing us that whenever we need you, whenever we want you, all we simply have to do is cry out. So this morning we're asking you, Holy Spirit, move in our life today. Touch our hearts and let, never ever let us lose this hunger that we have for you. Jesus, it's all about you. It's always going to be about you. So let us never forget that. And it's in your mighty name we pray. Everybody said? Amen. 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 You guys can head back to your seats on your way. Give you a few high fives. Tell somebody you're, you're glad that they're here this morning, even though it's mandatory. You know, I'm just kidding. Sagu, Sagu, how are you guys doing today? If you're doing good, say yeah. yeah. Okay, all right. Man, I, I'm excited about this weekend. I, I do reign from the great state of Oklahoma. Uh, that's what's up, right? And so, and let's, you know, here's the thing. I, today, we're friends. Today, uh, we have a common bond. But this weekend is the start of college football. And uh, I got to say, Texas, I love you today, but as of Saturday, you'll become my enemy once again. And so 
Just teasing, just teasing. Hey, so glad to be here this morning. And man, it has been an awesome couple services that we have. Man, can we give it up uh, for Pastor Hannah and Pastor Tito for the messages that they delivered last night? We stayed up till probably uh, a little bit later than we should discussing the question, is the Cheeto a chip or a snack? There are just so many layers to that question. I'm telling you, man, it, uh, we, it just blew my mind. Well, anyway, hey, I don't want to take any more of this man's time today. I am so excited that you get to hear from one of our brand new DYDs. Uh, I know that he's going to bring the word today. He is an Alabama native. However... He reigns from the state of Tennessee. So, Sagu, do me a favor. Get up on your feet and show some love to the one and only Brooks Teal in the house today. Yeah, roll tide from Tennessee. That sounds weird, don't it? Who said go balls? My goodness, one of, one of our girls. How many Alabama fans? Raise your hand. How many of you are not? Yes. Okay. Y'all don't like trophy cases, do you? Huh? I gotcha. <laughs> We're going to talk about losers here in a little bit, all right? Listen, I've had a thing called a sinus infection. How many know what I'm talking about? My voice is a little shot, but we're going anyway. Amen? Are you awake? Yes, sir. All right, good. It's good to be at Sagu. Uh, President Bridges, thanks for having me in. I hope this is not the last time. We'll see you here in just a little bit. I like to cut loose and have a good time. How many of you like to have a good time? <clears throat> How many of you like Texas? It's hot, ain't it? Y'all got, y'all got a cricket problem here. That's obvious. It's flat, hot, and brown, ain't it? Right? I got out of my car the first day, my underwear turned into saran wrap, right? <laughs> and then it just disintegrated. I never saw it again. Just went away, right? And so it was rough on a big man. I got out of the car and got down on the ground because that's where the firefighter told me on the field trip where the oxygen was, right? <laughs> down there crawling around trying to find it, all right? Listen, y'all are a cool bunch of people, but I got some people cooler that I want to show you on the screen, all right? My family. This is my, Yeah. Yeah, that's my wife, all right? It really is my wife, okay? Just letting you know that. And that's what happens when you have the anointing on your life, so you get your own good woman, see? Yeah. <laughs> there ain't no, there's hope for you in here, all right? I said, my Lord, please go on a date with me, please. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we got some more pictures of my, uh, my sons, my oldest. This is Griffin. Now, he's a young stud, ain't he? He just started kindergarten. He's already had a red day. Anybody know what that is? Yeah, I found out what it is, all right? Takes after his dad, causing a little disruption. But he's an incredible young fellow. You can just see it in his eyes. He's already a young leader, and I'm not worried about him. I know that the Lord, is, his hand is on his life. And I believe he is going to the nations, and I believe he is going to light this world on fire. And so that's my little boy, Griffin. He's going to be six this month. And then the next one, that's my mini-me. That is, <laughs> that is Reeves. His name is Reeves, and he just turned one. And how many of you know he likes birthday cake? I'm just going to be honest with you. He's already eating. He's eating everything, steak, everything. He's eating it all. And... Uh, Listen, when you squeeze him, he smells like a honey bun, all right? <laughs> How many of you like a honey bun? I'm built by honey bun, right? Love it. And so I love my family. And so listen, I'm fixing to talk to you today. And here, listen, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't come states away and leave them at home for y'all to sit there and not get something out of it this morning. You're in college, all right? You ought to be able to handle it, right? Okay, and so uh, we're going to get into it. <laughs> President, I don't know if they get it or not. I'm just, if you got your Bible, open it up. Mark 3, 13 through 15. Mark 3, 13 through 15. 
and then Matthew 28, 16 through 20. And while you're turning, listen, we want to talk about climbing the mountain of your life today. It's a topic of hunger this morning. I, I, I want to tell you something. The Lord is always in higher places, and he always wants you to come where he is, all right? And I'm just here to tell you today that we ain't waiting on him. He's waiting on us, okay? And he always has a higher and better plan than you could ever imagine or pin out. The fact of the matter is, is that if I could come in here today, if I could take the Lord's, what he's got planned, and I could show it to you, you would drop what you're doing. You would, you would make all the arrangements you could to run after what it is that he had planned, if I could show it to you today. Can I tell you this? You have no idea how valuable you are. You have no clue how important and how valuable you are. I don't know what kind of home life you come from. I don't, know, I don't know why you're here. I don't know if you're here to do ministry. I don't know if you're here just to play ball and this is where you ended up. Like, I don't, I don't know why you're here, but I know this. He has a plan for your life, and you have no clue how valuable you are. But I can give you a little bit of hint. You are worth the life of a son. And I grew up in church, and so many times in church, we have a habit of saying things like, oh, I wasn't worthy of it. Oh, I wasn't, I wasn't worthy, and I'm not good enough. And we, we get into that lingo. Can I tell you today, that ain't the way the Father thinks of you. He thought your life was very much worth it. And if he didn't, he'd have to apologize to the son for taking the beating and the bruising for you. He's got a life planned for you. My little boy Griffin, I just showed you him. And a, and a few years ago, when we, were in, when we were in the middle of the pandemic, it was the summertime and the 4th of July was coming up. And, and, um, and they told us on the news and everything that we couldn't. My Lord, what is happening right now? <laughs> I, don't, I, I thought we were fixing to take off. I didn't know. <laughs> we were in the middle of the pandemic, and the 4th of July was taking place, and they, and they told us, you know, they said, you don't need to get together, you know, because of COVID, and, and you don't need to get together and, and have any kind of get together or barbecue for the 4th of July. Can I go ahead and tell you something? You don't tell somebody in the South they can't have a barbecue, all right? That's the bottom line. You know how we celebrate our independence? Throwing a dead animal on the grill. And if you don't eat meat in here, I apologize. I'm sorry. I do, right? And so we got together and we threw the, threw the meat on the grill and we're great. I'm a great parent. I'm, we're great parents, all right? Griffin, he drank about 15 or 20 Capri Suns that day. How many like a Capri Sun? That Pacific Cooler Capri Sun just hits different, don't it? He had about 15 or 20 of them. He was jacked up, you know, hyper. That's probably why he's getting red days, right? <laughs> we get in the truck to go home that night, and he crashes in the back seat, just crashes. You could just, I could hear him. Literally snoring, all right? And how do you know I got the body type to snore, all right? How do you know what sleep apnea is, huh? Come on, big. All right, listen, I think I pass away in my sleep every night, all right? When I sleep and when I snore, it's the most annoying sound in the world, according to my wife. And some of y'all are going to get married one day, you're going to find this out. This is the things that she says to me. She'll wake me up and she'll say, you're getting on my nerves. <laughs> she'll say, why are you breathing? <laughs> why am I breathing? Roll over. It's a lot to roll this over, guys. <laughs> right? It's annoying. But when my, little boy, when my little boy sleeps and when he snores, it's the most beautiful sound in the world. He's got two little nostrils. They're like pinholes. And he's like, you know, whistling. <laughs> I'll, I'll get up in the middle of the night, and you'll know this when you have kids. I get up, and I go into a room, and some of you know this. 
and I'll go in there just to hear them sleeping. There's just something about hearing them breathe because the sound of breathing is the sound of life. And if I know they're breathing, if I can hear them breathing, I know they're living. You're going to breathe heavier at times in this life, but if you're breathing, you're living. And if you woke up, he has an assignment for you. And so we're sitting there, and, and we're driving home, and we're hearing him snore. And my wife, you know, we were getting into this conversation, and we were doing the typical parent thing, and we're saying, I'll listen to him. And he's so sweet, you know. And then my wife, she asked, started asking questions, and she said, you know, have you, been, have you ever thought about his life? And I was like, what do you mean? She's like, like what he's going to do with his life. And I said, I don't know. He likes cars. Maybe he'll be a race car driver or something. I don't know, you know. She said, yeah. And then she asked me a question that really messed me up. She said, have you ever thought about how long he's going to live? And I said, what kind of sick question is that? <laughs> she said, no, I mean, like, I hope he lives a long time. I said, yeah. And I threw out the first thing I thought. I hope he lives to at least see 100 years old, right? That's a pretty good lifespan. You live to 100, that's a long time. And then I had to do some math in my head, and that's dangerous when that happens, right? She said, what year would that be? I said, well, he's born in... 2017, if he lived to 100, that'd be the year 2117. Buddy, that jacked me up. That jacked me up. And I started thinking about his life. See, you prepare, you prepare for the future by living in the now, right? And I started thinking about his life, and then I started thinking about my life. And I thought, maybe I shouldn't have had that honey bun, you know? And I gave myself a little grace. I said, well, what if I lived to 100? What year would that be? And I, I, I thought, that'll be the year 2086 if I see 100. And then I got really sad because I thought, if he sees 100, even if I see 100, I won't be there to see it. And I started thinking about the life I was going to live in front of my son. See, the way you live... When you're done here, when your time is done here on this earth, you're going to leave what's known as a legacy. If you spend your life lying, when you're gone from this earth, people are going to, people are going to think of you and they're going to say of you, he, was, he or she was a liar. You struggle with alcohol, you can be known as an alcoholic. If you're a greedy person, if you live your life as a greedy person, you're going to be known as a greedy person. But if you love the things of God, if you're hungry for the things of God, they'll say of you, they were a lover of the things of God. They were hungry for the things of God. And I want to know today, what do you want to be known for? What are you going to be known for? We're fixing to read about when Jesus appointed and when he commissioned the 12. You think about Jesus, he came, he rocked the world, right? The multitude of people, they would show up, they would see what he was going to do, they would, they would show up to hear what he was going to say. It's easy to show up every now and then. It's easy to show up to a chapel. It's easy to go to church on Sundays. It's easy to go to church once a week, maybe on Wednesday nights. That's easy. I'm not talking about those days. I'm talking about your every days. See, a lot of people showed up to see them every once in a while, but very few of them said, I'm going to give up everything, and I'm going to follow them every day. I'm going to give up my career. I'm going to give up my relationships. I'm going to give up everything that, 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 I, that I love and that means something to me. I'm going to give that up. Very few of them did that. Can I tell you that we're not reading about the many who showed up every now and then, but we're reading about the few thousands of years later who said, I'm going to give them my every day. You have a choice today. 
You can be one of the many out there. You can be one of the few that we'll read about for years to come. It's up to you. It's up to you. And right now in your age group, we live in a world where everybody wants to be different. Everybody. And they'll do anything they can to be different. Can I tell you that what we're doing in this room today, what we're doing in these altars today, can I tell you that's as different as it gets? You want to be different? Let's be different. Let's get all that he has for us. Do you want all of it today? Are you hungry for it today? What if I told you today that there was a piece of property, a plot of land that's been bought, that's been purchased, that's been paid for, and it's got your name on it? What if I told you that? A beautiful landscape, just as far as the eye could see, that only you and him, it was just for you and him to enjoy. What if I told you to that? But to get it, you had to climb a mountain. To get to it. What if I told you that there was a view with your name on it today? I want to know if you want to climb. Because there's an invitation on the table for you today. Mark 3, 13 through 15 says, He climbed a mountain and he invited those he wanted with him. They climbed together. He settled on 12, and he designated them apostles. And the plan was that they would be with him and that he would send them out to proclaim the word and give them authority to banish demons. We see there that he's climbing to higher places, right? And it said he climbed a mountain, and he invited those he wanted with him. How many of you know what an invitation is? An invitation says, hey, You've wrote out a list of people you want to invite to something you have going on. Who do you put on the list? You put on the list people that you love, that you care about, that you've had experiences with, right? And an invitation says, hey, I love you. You mean so much to me. And I've got this thing going on, and I want you to be a part of it. Right? I'm graduating. Come be a part of it. I'm getting married. Come be a part of it, right? It's an invite. It's not a demand or a command, though, right? You put the invitation out there, you're not saying, hey, if you don't show up, I'm going to slit your throat, right? You're not saying nothing like that. Hey, if you don't show up, I'm going to slash your tires. I'm going to hunt you down, right? <coughs> no, no. I love you, and, and here's an invite because I want to have an experience with you. He was inviting them. He found them, he loved them, and he said, hey, are you hungry for more? Because I have a plan for your life. And there's an invitation there for you. And so he climbed a mountain and he invited those. And it said they climbed together, which meant when they accepted the invite and they got there, they didn't have to do it alone. Can I tell you, he don't want you to do it alone. And as they climbed, he settled on 12, and he designated them them apostles. And as they climbed together, he unfolded a plan. And I'm just going to tell you, this is the best plan you will ever find. You come in here, you're like, what am I going to do with my life? We got the plan right here. We got the plan right here. Here was the plan. You want to hear it? The plan was that they would be with him. I'll clap for myself. That's a pretty good plan, ain't it? What's the plan for my life? He wants you to be with him. Some of y'all get in here just a little bit. And once you've been with me, here's here's the other part of the plan. I'm going to send you out to proclaim the word, and I'm going to give you the authority to banish demons. What does the Lord want me to do with my life? He wants you to be with him. And then he wants you to go, regardless of what your vocation is, regardless of what your career path is. He wants you to be with him, and he wants you to go and tell everybody how you've been with him and how good he is. That's a good plan. Well, what if things come my way? Oh, this is the best part of the plan right here. I'm going to give you everything you need to knock it out of your way. 
That's a good plan. That's a surefire plan. I'm going to give you everything you need. The Great Commission, we've read this before. Meanwhile, the 11 disciples were on their way to Galilee. 11. We started with 12. Now we got 11. Somebody quit, didn't they? Meanwhile, the 11 disciples were on their way to Galilee, headed for the mountain Jesus had set for their reunion. And the moment they saw him, they worshiped him. That's an appropriate response. When you feel him, when you see him, you worship him. That's the appropriate response. Some, though, they held back, not sure about worship, about risking themselves totally, which meant that some doubted that it was really him. You know, I'm not trying to browbeat this morning or come down on anybody this morning, but I saw some of you up here and I saw some of you back in the seats. I saw some of you with your hands lifted and I saw some of you real reserved, not really getting into it. And I don't know where you're at on your walk, but I don't know if all of y'all have really bought into this thing yet. Can I tell you, if you're going to risk anything, go ahead and risk it all for him. When you risk yourself for him, you're not risking anything at all. He's just taking you higher the whole time. Go ahead and risk it all. He's the best retirement plan you ever have. Risk it. Risk it. Not only that, he's the only one worth risking. It all for. Some doubted that it was really him. But Jesus, even with the doubters, Jesus was undeterred and he went right ahead. See, here's the deal. Whether you get on board or not, he's still going ahead and he's giving his charge. Jesus, undeterred, he went right ahead. He gave his charge. God authorized and commanded me to commission you. Go out and train everyone you meet, right? Make disciples far and near in this way of life, right? Follow the plan, right? Make, marking them by baptism in the threefold name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Then instruct them in the practice of all I have commanded you. And I'll be with you as you do this day after day after day, right up to the end of the age. <laughs> he appoints them and then he commissions them. Twelve started, eleven finished. Can I tell you that somebody quit? And can I tell you this, on this journey called life, people are going to quit on you. And if you go down the ministry path, buddy, they're really going to quit on you. Ain't nothing like some good old church folks. They're going to walk out on you. And some of you come in here today and you said, I've already had people quit on me. Because some of you come in here today and your dad walked out on you. Your mom walked out on you. They quit on you. And that's unfair. Can I tell you today, he will never quit on you. He gets there. Some of them see them, they start worshiping. Some of them doubt. Can I let you off the hook today? There's going to be days you're going to doubt on this journey when your loved one gets the report that they only got a few months left to live, that they have cancer. When you get, when you get the report that things aren't going well and, or you lose your job or, or the bills keep coming, can I tell you that on this journey called life, things happen, and there's going to be days you're going to get up and doubt, and that's okay because even when they could see them, they doubted. But even on the days that you doubt, Jesus will still be climbing. He'll still be with you. Even if you doubt, here's what he's saying. Just follow the plan. Just be with me. Go out and tell them how good I am and how you've been with me. Baptize them. Get them saved, right? Instruct them in the way that they should live. You say, well, how long do I have to do that? He says it right here. Day after day after day to the end of the age, I'll be with you as you do it. That means you do it to the end, but you don't have to do it alone. Every day that you get up and you climb, 
He'll be there waiting and he'll climb with you. You were built to climb to higher places, Southwestern. You're not just here to go to school. You're here because the Lord assigned you here. And he wants to take you to greater heights where the views are better. He wants to show you things that you can't see on the ground. Every one of you in here were built to climb. I want to know today, are you ready to do it? Are you hungry for it? I'm not going to say when I was little because I ain't never been little. When I was a young man, I want you to go with me for a second. Imagine, uh, you know, a little, you know, fourth, fifth grade Brooks. I didn't have a beard in my face, just like a smooth baby's butt, right? <clears throat> and I'll never forget, I had a bike, and that bike, I had wore that bike out. The nuts and bolts were all uh, rickety. The, the tires were dry rotted. All the rubber was torn off the thing. The handlebars were bent. My dad had ran over it in the driveway. My bike was a mess, right? I'll never forget I had a bike pump. I'd go out there and pump the tires up, and I'd get out of the driveway, and they'd go flat again, right? The bike was wore out. And so I'll never forget I went to my dad, and I said, hey, dad, I need a new bike. And my dad's got this little sinus thing that he does, right? He always goes, <coughs> before he says anything. <clears throat> and he's real country. <laughs> hey, Dad, I need, I need a new bike. <clears throat> yeah, yours is wore out, ain't it? That's what he said. <laughs> yeah, it is. He said, <clears throat> and I ran over it in the driveway. <laughs> I said, yeah, I know. He said, <clears throat> we'll go on down there on Saturday and get you a new one. I said, all right. I knew it, right? Dad got paid on Fridays. We were going down there on Saturdays, all right? How many of you know what I'm talking about? Payday, right? And when I was growing up, my mom, she would take us to Walmart and Winn-Dixie, the grocery store, on Thursdays and write the check because she knew it would be good on Friday because that's when Dad got paid. Some of y'all don't know nothing about that, but these guys over here do. I'm just going to tell you. And I'll never forget, I was thinking about the bike that I wanted. And some kids in my neighborhood, we always rode bikes. And they always, they had these bikes with like the pegs and stuff on it. And, you know, if they had, you had a little girlfriend, they could ride on the back, you know, and put her hands on your shoulders and ride. And I mean, I, I thought, yeah, that's what I want, you know. I mean, I didn't have a girlfriend, but if I had a bike like that, I might get one. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> right? And so I, I thought about the bike that I wanted and I, I, I was thinking in class, I was like, I need to go to somebody that knows about bikes. And so I went to some kids in my class called the Skater Kids. Anybody know what I'm talking about? They wore uh, jeans called Jinkos. Some of y'all don't know what I'm talking about. The biggest, ugliest jeans I've ever seen in my life. They wore a shoe called an Airwalk. How I many of you know what I'm talking about? Ugly, wide shoe, like pillows. Terrible, right? And then they had a chain that they took from their front belt loop and it hung way down. And it went up to their wallet. And they were just letting everybody know they were at LMV. Does anybody know what that is? A lunch money victim, right? <laughs> and then they had their hair, their bangs in their eyes. And they do this number all the time. I'm like, man, just go to the barbershop and get you a haircut. You ain't got to do all that, right? <laughs> they knew about it, though. I didn't, know about, I didn't know about all this. But I said, I'm going to go to the ones that know about it. So I went to them. I said, hey, I'm looking for a bike. What kind of bike are you looking for? And I told them, and they pulled out a magazine. It was an X Games magazine. I said, oh, they're getting serious, ain't they, right? And they turned to the bike section, and there it was on the bike section, a chrome and red BMX bike. How many know what I'm talking about? I said, oh, yeah, that's the one. That's it. I said, I'm, I'm for sure getting a girlfriend if I get that. <coughs> And they said, yeah, that's a BMX. That's a good bike. I said, where can I get one? They said, well, there's a little bike store, you know, in town called Cycle Escape. I don't, even, I don't even think it's there anymore, but it's called Cycle Escape. I said, okay. I said, where's that at? They said, do you know where McDonald's is? I said, boy, that's a dumb question. <laughs> yeah. They said, well, you can go in and get that. I said, well, how much does it cost? And then he showed me the cost. And I thought, oh, that's a lot. I said, what if I can't get that? He said, well, get a Huffy or something. That'll, that'll be good. I said, all right, I got you. Saturday morning rolls around. I get up, I go in there and I tell dad, hey, are we getting a bike? <laughs> yeah. 
gets up. He had a regular cab Chevrolet truck. He got in. I got in the middle. My mom got in the passenger seat. and We took off across Montgomery, Alabama. I'll never forget, I saw the golden arches. I knew we were getting close, and I was getting hungry, right? But I said, we're on a mission here. We got to get my bike. We turned, and I see the sign, cycle escape. And I thought, all right, dad knows exactly what I need, right? And we drive, and all of a sudden, we go right past cycle escape. And I'm leaning to the window like, hey, dad, there's cycle escape. And this is what my dad said. <laughs> we ain't going to no cycle escape. He said, uh-huh. we're going to Walmart. <laughs> How do you know what I'm talking about, Walmart? That's where dreams go to die, ain't it? You don't believe in aliens, but you see one every time you go into Walmart. You want a bottle of juice? Don't worry. Somebody else has already drank it and put it back on the shelf. <laughs> dreams go to die, right? I thought, my Lord. Maybe they, maybe, maybe they got a BMX in here. We went in. They didn't. They did not have a BMX. I'm sitting there in the back. I'm looking at the bike rack, and I'm like, oh, no. And, but then all of a sudden, one caught my eye, and I thought, ah, that kind of looks like the BMX. It wasn't chrome and red, but it was gray and orange, right? Yeah. And I thought, ah, that kind of looks like it, you know? And I reached up and I pulled it down. And it wasn't a BMX. It was a bike called a mongoose. How many know what I'm talking about? A mongoose. Yeah. Orange and gray. It didn't have chrome pegs. It had black pegs on it. But it looked good. It was a mongoose. I said, what is a mongoose? My dad said, I think it's some kind of varmint, you know. The mongoose was the great value BMX. That's what it was. Does anybody know what great value? Don't get shy on me in here. I ain't talking about no cinnamon toast crunch. I'm talking about some toasted cinnamon cereal squares comes in a bag. How many know what I'm talking about? It might as well say, tear your stomach up on the bag, won't it? You'll eat it. You'll be on the throne, holding the wall, trying to figure out what's going on with your life. There's a reason why there's twice as much and it's two times less. It's called filler. And it ain't no good for you. All right? Mongoose. That bike had a seat on it, looked like a little slice of pie. I sat down on it. They thought I was doing a magic trick inside Walmart. I'm talking about abracadabra. Now you see it, now you don't. That bike seat, it went up into the abyss. And I never saw it again. I think the bike seat, I think it's still on this stage right now. <laughs> Pedals was up in between my thighs. I didn't know I could get anything in between my thighs. If I took off running, it'd sound like a standing ovation in this room. <laughs> Handlebars was up. They was up here. I ain't going to get into that because I might want to come back. <laughs> but I need some help up there. The bike did not fit, all right? I'll just say that. And I'm sitting there, and my dad comes around, and he goes, uh-huh. Rhonda, come here and look at this right here. <laughs> he said, boy, you ain't got enough bike. <laughs> That's what he said to me. I'm like, dad, dad's joking on me. He said, get off that bike. Get off of it. I'll never forget, I got off of it, barely. I was standing there, and all of a sudden, I hear it. My dad comes around the corner with the biggest, ugliest bike I've ever seen in my life. It looked like something the Wicked Witch was driving. <laughs> Big, ugly, lame, right? And that's how ministry in this walk looks sometimes to everybody else that don't know nothing about it. They'll say things like it's big, it's ugly, and it's lame, but they don't know. They don't have a clue, but I tell you what, the Father knows best, right? And this is what the father, this is what my father told me. He said, no, 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 no. He said, this bike, this bike right here, this is, this is you. I said, no. He said, yeah, it is. You too big for that other bike. Look at this. It's got big old tires on it. It holds you up. It's good. Look at that seat on that thing, right? I said, well, what's that? He said, that's the brakes. 
Watch that. That's the gears. When the pedaling gets hard, you just shift them gears. You can, you can just go easier. I was like, okay. He said, get on it. I was like, I don't want to get on this thing. I finally got on it, and I thought, well, it does feel good on my lower back. <laughs> Handlebars are right where I needed them to be. Pedals were right where I needed them to be. And I thought, well, it feels good. He said, boy, that right there is a mountain bike. He said, you were built for the mountain. And I know we've had a good laugh in here, but some of you have been out here in the street living a life you were never built to live. When you were built for the mountain, when you were built for the high place, can I remind you again today, you were built for the mountain. You have no clue how big the plans are for your life. You have no idea. You have no clue. But you were built to go to the top with him. He wants to climb with you today. He wants to climb with you today. We got a picture of the mountain. How many know what that mountain is right there? That is El Capitan. And if I could have somebody come play softly in band, if you want to come get ready. That is El Capitan right there. During the pandemic, I watched a documentary called Free Solo. Some of you have seen it. It's about an American mountain climber named Alex Honnold who free soloed El Capitan. And some of you say, what is free solo? It means he did it without any ropes or harnesses. I know, what a nut job, right? I'll never forget, I was watching it, and my brother-in-law was watching it with me, and he goes, you think you could do that? I said, bro, I can't even hardly get to my mailbox and check my mail. Look at the trees down there at the bottom. Some of like a hundred and something feet tall. If that gives you any idea of how tall that mountain is. And it's basically just straight up and down. And Alex Honnold free soloed it. It took him a few hours to do it. But you know what? He didn't just go up there one day and climb it all the way to the top. He had to buy into this thing. He, he literally sold everything. He, he, he deleted relationships that were no good, that got in the way. And he literally lived in a van down by the river, right? He studied climbing. He studied the rock. And I thought to myself, this guy is such an idiot. Every day he would go climb it with ropes and harnesses and other people. And he would climb it and... After every climb, he would go back to his van with a notepad and he'd make notes of what he experienced on the climb. He, he, he would write down where every grab hole, where every foothold was on the, the climb of this thing. He knew just how to get up that mountain. And when people were calling him crazy, they were saying, you're, you're crazy for doing this. You're going to die doing this. This was his response. I don't care if you call me crazy, and if I die, I die. If I perish, I perish, but I'll die doing the thing I love, and that's climbing the rock. I thought, man, that was some determination. And then he followed it up with this. You haven't seen the views the way I've seen the views. You'll never understand what I do because you've never been where I've been before. You've never done what I've done before. And until you've done it, you don't have no voice in my life. I'll never forget, I got home with that bike that afternoon and was going to go ride bikes with some of my buddies. And I came out of the driveway on my new mountain bike. I looked like Lance Armstrong on the Tour de France. I had a water bottle in the middle of that thing. I had it full of ice and fruit punch, Minute Maid fruit punch. I waterfalled it in front of my friends, letting them know I meant business. I'll never forget, they pulled up, some of them on their BMXs, they're huffies, one or two mongooses. Some of them had their girlfriends on their bike. 
and we took out right, and they were doing tricks. I couldn't do a lot of tricks. My bike wasn't flashy. I couldn't do all that. All I could do is sit out upright and cruise, right? I'll never forget, in the back of my neighborhood was a steep hill. And only the experienced kids could get to the top of that hill. Only the older, experienced kids could get to the top. But on the other side of that hill was my friend Marcus's house. And Marcus's house had pool tables and BB guns and frozen pizza, <laughs> which is what I loved. <laughs> the only way to get there was to go up the hill, or you could go the long way around the neighborhood which took forever, and most of the time, everybody quit by the time they got there. I'll never forget, we're riding that day, and I thought, I want to go to the top of the hill, and I want to go to Marcus's house. And so I announced to the rest of them, hey, I'm going to Marcus's house. And they were like, all right, and they take out the long way. I said, no, 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 we're not going that way. We're going up the hill. They said, you can't get up that hill. I said, oh, no, my father has bought and purchased and given me this bike. And he said, this thing can climb mountains. And they said, well, let's just see you do it. I'll never forget. I took up, I ran up some speed here. I hit the hill and I got about a fourth of the way up and my fat little thighs began to jiggle. I thought, oh no. And they're laughing behind me. And all of a sudden, I remembered what my father said. When the pedaling gets tough, you can shift the gears and pedal a little bit easier. I'll never forget, I began to shift the gears, and the pedaling got easier. Next thing I know, I'm halfway up the hill. And I turn around, I look at my buddies, and this is what they're doing. They're going, he might do it. He might make it. I get three-fourths of the way up, and I turn around, I look again. And they're saying stuff like, if he can do it, I can too, maybe. Hunger is contagious. When you're hungry enough for something, I believe you'll see it every time. A hungry heart for the things of God will see a move of God every time. I'll never forget, I get to the top. And I get to the top and I become the coach. Some of them are trying to work their way up the hill. Not all of them, but some of them. Some of them are just pedaling as hard as they can. Some of them have got off their bike. They're walking it up. And I'm saying, come on, Tommy. Come on, Marcus. Come on, Trey. Come on, Pierre. Pedro. Some of them quit. One of them kicked their girlfriend off, sent her home. He took his bike and went home too. <laughs> quit her. If you quit, you lose. You quit on him, you lose every time. I'm not looking for the weak today. I'm looking for the strong who wants to climb today. You either want it or you don't. I'll never forget. Not all of them made it, but a few of them did. And we went to Marcus's house and we enjoyed. And so we look at this man's life, Alex Honnold. He climbed this mountain. At one point on the climb, there was a crack. He had to shimmy up it for like 45 minutes. At one point on the mountain, there was nowhere to grab or stand. He had to literally jump off the mountain, risking himself totally. (coughs) Risking his life. to grab onto the other side. Go ahead and risk yourself with him today. Until finally he reached the top and the whole world reads about him and the whole world watches his documentary and he accumulates riches But I look at what drove him to the mountain. His mom never, never told him that she loved him. His dad died when he was a young age. He was picked on. He was made fun of. And it drove him 
to the rock. He gave his life to it, and because he did, he experienced something nobody else has ever experienced. The Father has an experience for you. Can I tell you, when you have a real experience with him, it will both satisfy you and leave you wanting more. His glory will satisfy you and leave you wanting more. And I know some of you are sitting there and your heart's beating and you're saying, that's what I want for my life. I want more. I'm hungry for more. I want to see the view. What if I told you today that there was a view with your name on it? Beautiful. As far as the eye could see. I already bought, purchased, and paid for for you, right? Would you climb to see it? I'll even sweeten the deal. What if I told you that every day you had to report to the base of that mountain and climb to get to it? But what if I told you this? Every day that you got there, there would be a guide who would climb with you. There, there wouldn't be a day you wouldn't show up that he wouldn't be there. And that on that climb, you and him would form a relationship. Every day that you climbed with him, the relationship would go further. You would laugh together. You would cry together. You would tell him about your life. He would tell you everything he thought about you. And the whole time, your eyes would be fixed on him and he would take you higher and higher and higher. And there would be days your legs would give out, but he'd come in and give you the support you need to keep going. And there would be days there'd be nowhere to grab, nowhere to hold on to. But the God would open up his mouth and make a way. You fall off. He catches you. He puts you back on. Until one day, you go right over the top, and there it is. You take in a view like never seen before. Can I tell you today that there is a mountain, and it's called your life. There is a piece of property, and it's called your purpose and your destiny. And there is a guide, and his name is Jesus. And he's crazy about you. And he's saying, are you hungry for more? Do you want, the, you want to see the plan I have for your life? Saying the prayer and giving your life, that's just the start of it. There's more. There's more. And if you want it, you can have it. I'm inviting you to climb with me. We're at the beginning of the school year. Some of you are finishing. Some of you are just starting. It's been a journey for my life. See, some of you don't know this. It's an honor for me to be in the room. And my wife has a master's degree. All I've got is a PhD, a public high school diploma. <laughs> I was told as a young man I was severely ADD and I'd had to be on medication the rest of my life. I was told I was the worst public speaker they had ever heard in a public speaking class at a JUCO that I went to. I was told I was the worst writer they had ever seen. But I found out a long time ago that if I would get up and just lock eyes with him, if I got up and I would just climb with him, he would take me places that others will never go. He'll get you in the room. He'll get you to the opportunities. He'll bless you along the way. He'll give you things along the way. And all that stuff is good. But can I tell you, the greatest part of the journey is not what he can do for you or not what he can give you. The greatest part of the journey is time spent with him because he is the prize. He's the prize. Come on, get on your feet in this room right now. Come on. 
Come on, would you stand? Would you stand? I want you to close your eyes and I want you to lift your hands to heaven. And some of you like, I don't know, this is kind of unusual, but I want some of you to go ahead and risk yourself today. Some of you need to get a little bit uncomfortable. We give an altar calls and you just sit back there grabbing the seat. You just sit back there thinking about what's next, how you can leave the room, and you're missing an opportunity to lock eyes with him. And you're missing an opportunity to climb a little bit higher with him. But I'm going to give you an invitation. The bottom line is this. I've done my part today. I want all, you, I want all of you to respond. But you have a choice today. You can be one of the many who walk out and don't get anything, or you can be one of the few who say, I'm stronger than that, and I want more for my life. But more than that, I want more of him. I want to get all that he has for me. I want to find my purpose. I want to find my destiny. And if that's you, I'm not talking about being saved. Most of you are probably saved in the room, or you you think you are anyway, right? (laughs) I'm talking about going higher with him today. And if that's you, come on invite. Come on, if you want to go and get everything, that's fine. Whoever wants it, you want to go to a higher place. Come on. Come on. You want to go deeper with him and your relationship. If that's you, come up here and go ahead. Getting on your knees is really the appropriate response right now because some of you need to spend some time with him. And I don't know what kind of time schedule we're on, but I'm going to tell you this. this uh, listen, he ain't just something that matters. He's the only thing that matters. Holy Ghost, would you meet us? DYDs, come on, can we move around the room and just begin to lay hands? Come on, we're just going to take a few minutes. We're just going to plant the flag to say, hey, I'm going to hire with him. We're going to plant the flag. I don't care how lame they tell me I am. I don't care how big and ugly this thing looks. I'm going to climb the higher with him. I want the view. I want the view today. I want the view today. I want the view today. Don't worry about what they say about you. Some of you have been called things you're not. They walked out on you. He will never. You missed that on time. He will make up for lost time when you climb with him. Come on. Come on. Hunger has a sound. I want you to physically open up your mouth and just begin to talk to them. Hunger has a sound. Hunger has a sound. Hunger has a sound. What are we going to read about your life? What are we going to read about your life? I don't know how long you got, but I know this. If you'll get up and climb with him, he'll climb with you. Come on, some of you. Some of you need to get your life right. You've been playing the game. You've been playing church. I'm not talking about showing up every once in a while. I'm talking about giving up your every days. To say, I'm going to sell out. I'm going to risk everything. I'm going after him. Father, right now, right now. You have no clue how valuable you are. Some of you are getting that today. You're finding out my life does matter. You are worth the life of a son. He thought you were worth it. And even if you're back at your seats today, you can climb with them there too. He's worth it. So he said, it hadn't gone good. Even if you're breathing hard, if you're breathing, you're living. 
You're alive today. You're alive. He's got a plan for your life. Here's the plan. He's saying, be with me. Just be with me. And everything else will work itself out. Be with me. And I'll make a way. Climb with me. You'll find purpose and destiny. Father, we pray for hunger. That Sagu would be a place of hunger for the things of heaven. Hungry for the supernatural. When you climb with him, you'll see miracles. When you climb with him, you experience the supernatural. Right now, Father, we speak joy over the room. Joy. Some of you are experiencing joy for the first time in a long time. Joy is overtaking you right now. You're gonna get your laugh back. You're gonna get your smile back. Depression is gone because he's climbing with you and he's taking that weight off of you today. Anxiety, he's taking that off of you today. He's freeing you of that today. Gender confusion, sexual confusion, he's taking that off of you today. Perversion, he's taking that off of you today. You don't have to bear that load anymore. He's freeing you from that. And not one time has he been disappointed in you. Some of you need to hear that. Not one time has the Father been disappointed in you. Every day he's loved you. Every day he's been crazy about you. Every day he's been waiting on you. You were built to climb. And if you climb, maybe they'll climb. Come on, Tommy, pedal. Come on, Trey, pedal. If you climb, they'll climb. The quitters will quit, but the climbers will keep going. The Father has bought, he's purchased, and he's given you everything you need to get to the top. You were built for it. You were built for the mountain. You were built for the high place. He'll love you in the street every time, but he'll appoint you and he'll commission you on the mountain after you've met him there. Climb with him, climb with him, climb with him, climb with him, climb with him.
nothing else can satisfy oh nothing else nothing else nothing else will do i just i just i know i need you lord nothing else nothing else can satisfy nothing else What an outstanding uh, message. We'll say thank you to Brooks in a second, but as I'm listening to that, this is two things I'm hearing. One is obviously we want more of Jesus, and I hope everyone in the room wants more of Jesus, but the other thing I heard him say that is so true, and we need to get this through to you, the Apostle Paul said, opens most of his letters by saying to the saints called by God every one of you are called by God you don't have to seek a call you've been called the call is to climb the mountain and to be in relationship with Jesus Christ the occupation that he may direct you in is going to be different. But I don't care who you are. If you are a Christian today, you have a call. You have a purpose. You are part of that narrow path. And we walk on that narrow path at the invitation if we're willing to say yes to it. There are no haves and have-nots in the kingdom of God. And I need every one of you to understand that as Brooks shared so eloquently today. If you will just realize how loved you are. I say this in class often. You can't make God love you more by working for it. 
He already loves you. All you have to do is receive it and to live in it and to enjoy it and to prosper in it. I want you to say thank you to Brooks today for wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. The, pres the president told me to introduce myself, in case you don't know me. My name is Dr. Hayes. I'm the dean. I'm the dean of the College of Bible and Church Ministries, and uh, we, we love you. And uh, let me pray for you before we dismiss. Father, we thank you that for this wonderful time together. Father, I pray that you'll just seal what's going on in these altars. Father, that you will make, help everybody to understand just how deeply valuable they are to you, how much you love them. It doesn't matter what anybody has ever said about them in the past. Father, I know this group, there are many, many broken individuals who come from broken pasts. But Father, you are the healer of those broken pasts. And no matter how many times somebody has said to them, you're not enough. Father, help them to understand that you say to them every day, you are enough. Father, help them to find their identity not in their occupation, not in their athletics, not in their talents, but to find their identity in you. Father, we thank you that you are a good father. We thank you for this service today and let it transform us as we renew our minds about the way we think about ourselves and think about you. Help us to climb that mountain with the assistance of your Holy Spirit. And Father, we thank you and we ask these things in a strong, strong name of Jesus. Amen. If you want to continue praying, it's open to you. Uh, soak him in. See you tonight.